This is the recording for the Unit 3 post lab, Simple Machines and the Ballistic Pendulum. So this has to do with energy and momentum, respectively for Simple Machines it's energy only. So the first one here is that you have attended the lab intensive. Maybe I just pasted it in there, I did. The next one is the motivation, so look at the lab manual, and many of these make sense. So this one is about the lever, this one is about the wheel on axle. Notice that the wheel and axle on the car is actually not part of it because it goes the other direction. You actually need more force to get the wheel going than you actually need in order to come overcome the friction on the road. That's just the way it is. It goes in the opposite direction. Friction isn't actually not that much. You notice that when you put a car in neutral and you're able to push the car. It's actually not that much. Of course, it is enough to take a lot of energy away from the car, which is why you need to put your foot on the gas all the time. Then this one is the inclined plane here. Then this one is examples for the pulley. Then this one is the screw. Notice that the typical screw that you use in your household where you fasten something to a wall like shelves, that's actually not part of this because that is just a holder. It just holds onto it, but it's not a simple machine. Actually, if you wanted to look at the simple machine as being the wood screw, that actually is a wedge because it cuts through something. So I'm not sure if I mentioned this here. Any splitting tools? Well, I guess I could have mentioned that. Corkscrew here, for example, is a wedge. And then in general, this is about simple machines here, mechanical machines, simple machines. They're supposed to lessen the amount of force that you need in order to accomplish something. But of course, you're not going to get a free lunch, so you still have to do the same amount of work or even more because your efficiency is less than 100%. You have to work against friction or you have to lift the pulley system or you have to lift a heavy lever and so on. Or in the case of the wedge, you actually have to lift the axe. So, but otherwise, you wouldn't be able to split wood without the wedge of the axe. Okay, the other statements here, they seem to be correct, but they don't apply to the simple machines. All right, then the next question is, the computation problem about the block and tackle, and there's a lot of information here. And then at the very end, it says determine the efficiency. So look that up in the lab manual, how to do it. I'm going to tell you mid-ear here that the efficiency is the original work as if just you're lifting the object. That's the original work divided by the work that you actually have to do that you would have to do with the pulley system. And the original work would be here, the 4.9 newtons. These are the numbers, by the way, that you're getting. So you might get slightly different numbers. So 4.9 times the height that will actually give you the amount of work in order to simply just lift it. And then when you use the pulley system, in this case, with seven strings supporting it, so the applied force that you measure is 0.82. But how much string do you have to pull with, with seven string? And getting it to a height of 1.0 meters, you, of course, have to pull it for 7 meters. So 0.82 times 7 gets you that amount of work. You divide it into the other amount of work that I just mentioned, and you get something like, top of my head, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.9, somewhere around there, which is 80, 70, 60, 90 percent or so. Apparently, it's too sick fig, by the way. All right, the incline here. Again, a lot of information here at the very end. It says, again, determine the efficiency. So again, it's the amount of, it, it's the two works divided by, by each other. So the amount of work that you do without the incline, which is simply lo lifting the load to this height here. So multiply these two, which actually I already did here, right there. And divide that by the amount of, work that you have to do with the incline, which is this applied force here by pulling it up, and this is the length of the incline. Multiply these two, you come up with that amount of work divided into this one here, and it gives you the efficiency also in the neighborhood of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 40, 30% or something like that. You will see. I mean, I'm just doing this top of my head here, looking at these numbers. All right, a uh, few more things about the efficiency of a simple machine. 
why is the efficiency for the various simple machines less than 100%? Well, most simple machines are affected by friction. For example, incline, it's the friction between the loads and the inclined surfaces, and so on. And then certain parts within a simple machine may have to be lifted or moved as well, which means you have to do extra work on that one. So that's why the efficiency is less than 100%, and, and so on. Then why is the work done with a simple machine larger than the work without it? Well, that's the same statement here. Why is the actual mechanical advantage smaller than the ideal mechanical advantage? Well, it's the same statement here. So these, I'm asking here three kind of different questions. You know, I'm asking about the mechanical advantage. Here I'm asking about the amount of work. Here I'm asking about the efficiency. They're all related to each other. And that's why the way I ask the question, they all take the same statement answer. Then these here are the work done with a simple machine is more than the work done without it. The AMA is less than the AMA. What then is the advantage or purpose of a simple machine? Well, that must take a different answer than the previous three statements or questions, and that's this one here. The purpose is, is to make the work easier, reduction of the applied force, or changing the direction of it. Certain tasks might, might be either nearly impossible, and I'm, I like to use this, for example, moving a piano up some steps, so you do an incline instead. I think I have to cough one moment. I'm talking really fast and a lot, so I'm glad I was able to turn the microphone off. Then usually students determine that for inclines the efficiency increases the steeper the inclines get. What might be the reason for that? And again, that's Another answer here, the steeper the incline, the less support normal forces need to support the load. And therefore, since friction depends on the support force, that's why steeper inclines um, have a larger efficiency. But if you want to accomplish a task such as pushing a piano up on an incline, you probably want to go with a more shallow incline, even though you have to do more work. But at least you're able to accomplish the, the task with the relatively small amount of force. In principle, a block and tackle may have many light segments as possible. So in principle, any kind of simple machine may have an efficiency that just increases and increases, depending on how you design the simple machine. But for a block and tackle, there really is a limit. At some point, the friction between the many line segments and the many shoes is so large, and the weights of the movable block and the string, which may be rope or cable is so large that adding more line segments just does not reduce the applied force anymore. So there's no point of going beyond it because you, you cannot increase the efficiency or decrease the amount of force needed. So you would have to top the block and take it out at some point. All right, simple machine errors. There are quite a few. I didn't check all of them, but read through them here. And they almost all apply. Here's one that doesn't you did not measure the mass of the incline. It's not necessary. It's the surface that you push something along. I guess it has to have enough mass in order to be to, to support whatever you're pushing it up, but it's, it's not part of the experiment. You did not measure the angle, and you didn't lift the incline. And for the lever, actually, there is no friction. Look, look at the video that I supplied where I'm lifting the armchair with, with a shovel used as a lever. And really, when you look at it carefully, there really isn't any friction there. There are no parts moving against each other other than parts are moving through the air. So, so um, very little air resistance. So this one doesn't apply either. But I think all the others do. OK, then the conclusion here, as typical, these statements here are in the correct order. It's just that these here are in a different order. So you have to match them. And as usual, I'm starting out with, well, I'm listing the results here. I'm comparing the results. These here may be further outcomes of the experiment. Oh, hold on, hold on. Actually. I take that back. An assessment of the result. That's what this one is. So this one is assessment on, of the results. Then the next one is further outcome, outcomes of the experiment. And then the last one is about errors. And depending on what kind of simple machine it is, there might be different errors. That's why I'm listing quite a bit here. All right, the other experiment was the ballistic pendulum.
Okay, and just a small cough. Glad I turned the microphone off again. All right, so motivation for the ballistic pendulum. These first statements, they seem to be correct, but they don't apply to the ballistic pendulum. But these do. Obviously, ballistic star are used in forensic science, a ballistic pendulum, and so on, conservation of energy, projectile, ballistics, ballistics data. Why did I? <laughs> Interesting. I have that twice in there. OK. Check both. So let's see, projectile motion here. Now, this is a calculation. So this, like many others, test that you actually understood the calculation that that was that you used during the lab. This is the simpler one. This is the one on the projectile motion. So look up the equation and see how you plug in the 335 centimeters and see how you plug in the 100.0 centimeters. Notice that that's almost an overkill, but I had you say, hey, measure at 100 centimeters, and you know don't don't try to measure at 99 or 101, but Try to get to the 100. That's why this one looks like three or four significant figures. Determine the muzzle velocity from that. Then you do the calculation with the ballistic pendulum. That's, that's a little tougher. Notice at some point that it takes, the, the, the equation is a little tougher than the other one. At some point it uses the angle, in this case given as 39 degrees, and then it says 1 minus the cosine of the angle. But I'm already telling you, if, this, if you see 39 degrees, in your post lab, then 1 minus cosine of 39 degrees already is 0.22. So that's kind of a giveaway. I'm trying to highlight this here. And I have to cough again. OK, I just coughed, and then I forgot where I stepped off. So I'm going to try to recapitulate this. I'm going to start here again, even though if I might repeat myself. I had forgotten to turn the microphone back on. OK, so anyway, in this case here, this is the simpler equation. You plug in the 3 and the 35, uh, whatever number you have there. Plug it in. Plug in this one here. That seems almost overkill. But I did ask you to, to shoot it from a height of 100 centimeters. And I didn't ask for 99 or 101. I said, use 100. And so this is like three or four significant figures. You determine the muzzle velocity of that. from that. And again, this is the more simple equation to use. This one is the harder one for the ballistic pendulum. So here are all these numbers, respectively, the numbers that you have. Notice that it involves the angle and the cosine of the angle. But if you have 39 degrees, then I'm giving away. 1 minus cosine 39 degrees is 0.22. You could check that on your calculator, or you can just say, hey, that's what that is. I'm going to use that. And you come up with the initial velocity vi, and then there it is. Plug it in as meters per second. That initial velocity, of course, should match the original velocity here. Both of them are the same muzzle velocity from the same form dot gun. Of course, they're different in your experiment because it is an experiment. It has different measurement errors attached to it. So you do you will come up with two different results. And you also got that in the lab that you did. But technically they should be the same because it's the same form dark gun no matter how you use it. Okay, then the errors attached to it to this lab and there are quite a few friction between the pendulum and the board or wall, measuring the mass of the projectile, random and systematic error. That could be in this one there were no Lower pulleys lifting the incline, so don't check this one. I'm trying to get rid of it. Okay, let's see which others don't apply. There's like one that says measuring the length of the incline. It's right here. That doesn't apply. There was no incline in this particular lab. Measuring lengths along the lever. There were none. And gravity. Students like to argue that gravity influenced the different results for the different parts of the experiment. If you shoot it across or if you shoot it up, students try to argue that gravity plays a role in their giving us different results. No, it doesn't. It absolutely does not. Gravity acts in exactly the same way the 9.82 that is trying to pull it down in Alaska or the 9.80 that tries to pull it down in the lower 48 affects both trajectories in the same way. And when we calculate backwards, we ought to come up with the same result. So gravity does not play a role as far as the errors are concerned. And as far as the projectile motion is concerned, or the ballistic pendulum motion. 
All right, and then the very last one is that I we type the conclusions into our Word document and we'll email them. And that's the post lab for the Unit 3 labs.